So polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS has a number of symptoms that are associated with it. That includes things like acne, uh, funny hair growth or hirsutism and also really irregular cycles. And there are things that you can do in your lifestyle to help manage that. One of the biggest things that is associated with PCOS is actually the difficulty with weight management and also in controlling blood sugars. We call that glucose intolerance or insulin resistance. And women with PCOS have quite a high insulin resistance. So one of the things that you can do is to help keep your blood sugars really low. That's making sure you're not taking in high sugar, high carbohydrate foods. So really limiting the intake of those high sugary, high fat foods. Um, and also utilising that blood sugar, so going and doing physical activity. Weight management is really, really key to keeping your blood sugars down and also for managing the condition of PCOS. One of the other things associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome and to do with those irregular periods is the inability to know when to time intercourse and so therefore infertility. Once again, first line management of PCOS is actually lifestyle. So again, limiting the amount of sugary foods that you're consuming and making sure you're doing regular exercise is what we would always encourage you to do and really maintaining your weight within the ideal optimal body weight range. Only when you've done those things would we consider management such as ovulation induction treatment. Approximately 30% of infertility is due to the man. So it's really important for us to do a semen analysis to look at the quality and the quantity of sperm. So the parameters that we look at, we look at the concentration, how many sperm are there in the sample that we've got. We look at the motility, how well the sperm move. And we also look at the morphology, which is how the sperm look under the microscope. We also look at some other more detailed things on the analysis, things like the presence of anti-sperm antibodies and also the level of DNA damage or DNA fragmentation, which gives us a bit of an idea as to how much of the sperm have been affected by oxidative stress and environmental effects. Men are producing sperm all of the time. In fact, the lifespan of a sperm is around about 90 days. So we know that the changes in sperm are what the man was doing 90 days ago. So that can be changed in many cases. One of the parameters that we look at, DNA fragmentation, can actually tell us what sort of environmental stresses or oxidative stress the sperm has been under. You see, sperm is a really great barometer for a bloke's health. We know that if men are exposed to smoking and alcohol, that can increase the oxidative stress on sperm. We know that heat can also increase the oxidative stress. In fact, even systemic illness in a man can increase the amount of oxidative stress on sperm and that can be measured with the DNA fragmentation. The great thing is by men implementing changes in their lifestyle, so reducing smoking, alcohol consumption, perhaps not over exercising and spending hours on a bike in Lycra on a Sunday afternoon, um, introducing an antioxidant regularly into their diet, optimising the amounts of fruits and vegetables that they're consuming and frequent ejaculation will all help to improve the quality of a sperm sample. There is so much information out there on the foods that we should and shouldn't be consuming to help improve our chances of conceiving or our fertility. There is so much information out there that often it can be really, really overwhelming. And I think it's important to strip it right back to the basics because at present, the evidence says to us the most important thing that we should be doing around our diet is to be consuming as much fruit and vegetable as we can with every single meal and really limiting those processed foods, the foods that come out of a package, the foods that are high in preservatives, additives and colouring. We should be going back to basics and having whole foods, a good quality protein, good quality fats, whether that be from um, a meat or a vegetable based source and a lot of fruits, vegetables, nuts and grains. The things that I would suggest we do in moderation only is, is caffeine. We shouldn't really be having more than one or two cups of coffee a day. And an absolute no-no when you're trying to conceive is alcohol. The, the current guidelines suggest that women should not be drinking alcohol leading into pregnancy at all. 
Miscarriage is not an uncommon thing to happen. In fact, one in five women will report having had a miscarriage at some time in their life. It's just not something that is regularly talked about. The most common reason for a woman having a miscarriage is due to abnormalities in the developing baby. And this is most commonly due to an abnormal number of chromosomes. We call this aneuploidy. Most miscarriages present with bleeding and also cramping of the uh, lower abdomen in the first uh, 12 weeks of the pregnancy. However, some pregnancies have absolutely no symptoms and the first knowledge of pregnancy lost is an ultrasound that shows no fetal heartbeat when there actually should be one. There are a number of different ways that a pregnancy loss can be managed. Sometimes a woman undergoes spontaneous loss of the pregnancy, so conservative management with simple pain relief is the way to go. Sometimes doctors will recommend a medication called misoprostol, which will help to accelerate this process for a woman. And sometimes women are offered surgical management of a miscarriage. Recurrent miscarriage is actually defined as three or more consecutive miscarriages in a row, and less than 1% of women are in this group. However, it's not unreasonable to start looking into some investigations when a woman has had two or more miscarriages, if they're over the age of 35, because we know how much age can impact on the chances of conceiving. There are lots of different things that can lead to recurrent miscarriage. Persistent abnormalities in the developing baby, abnormalities to the shape of the uterus or abnormal growth such as fibroids or polyps. We know that endocrine disorders such as raised prolactin or even diabetes can increase the chances of miscarriage and even clotting disorders can also increase the chances of miscarriage. By far and away though the biggest group uh, of women who have recurrent miscarriage are actually unexplained. None of our tests show up any abnormalities. And this can be quite devastating for a couple. But what we do know is that if we institute pregnancy tracking in the, in the subsequent pregnancy and also uh, some support during that pregnancy, the chances of them having an ongoing pregnancy are far more likely.